All right, what's going on, everyone? Mm. We're back again for another live video, live from Shock Therapy here in North Phoenix. Hey guys, how's it going? So first off, if you joined us yesterday, thank you very much. We apologize we didn't get that feed to Facebook, but I think we've got that handled now. So hopefully everybody's able to watch us on both ends today. Um, also, we've got Mitch behind the camera as well as Chase, and Mitch is going to try and answer. There's Mitch. <coughs> And Chase, so we've got um, more people involved in trying to answer your questions. Do me a favor, if you can try and ask all the questions for the first part of this that are relative to what we're talking about at the time, that's awesome. We'll have at least 10 or 15 minutes at the end where we'll just stop everything and answer any questions that you've got. And we'll get to those as much as we possibly can. So first off, today is going to be discussing shocks, what makes them tick, different styles of shock, and a little bit about what we do on the inside of those. So um, basically, every shock on a UTV, uh, completely separate from, say, external bypasses and things like that on trophy trucks, and are, are designed a little bit different than this, but most UTV shocks have pistons, valving, and some sort of compression and rebound adjustment control. Now, all of these things put together are designed to do almost the same thing every time, no matter what shock design it is. That is to control the amount of compression or rebound that you need to control springs and overall driving style, as well as try to ramp up that compression as it gets to the last little bit for more bump stage to keep you from bottoming out. The reason is if you had enough compression in the shock, uh, that never changed. It was just one stroke of compression, same uh, from start to finish. The cars would have to ride so stiff to keep you from bottoming it out everywhere. It would be undrivable. So we have to manage that with a little bit softer system uh, through piston valving and a little bit stiffer system in bump stage, which is different from shock to shock. So let's look at pistons and valving. Typically, we've got a couple different styles sitting here. This is a piston inside of a Fox RC2. And you can see on here that we've got valving on top, which is rebound valving. And we've got valving sitting underneath it, which is compression valving. This valving, I'll grab a little bit right now out of the box so you can see how that works up close. <clears throat> Let's go for a 15 stack. Now I'm not going to grab a full stack right here because it's going to take us forever, but I'm going to do uh, a couple out of order. Valve stacks typically are done in a progressive diameter system. So <clears throat> as you can see, we've got valve shims in my hand in different diameters. Most of the time, valve stacks are stacked on top of the piston with a large shim at first and descending order in diameter as it goes up the stack. The reason for this is because if I just put this on top of a piston and I'll do one shim, oil is passing through these ports as this piston is moving up and down inside the shock. Oil comes through the bottom on this. And in order to get through that port, it physically has to bend this shim out of the way. It bows it up, fluid comes out the side, and allows this system to progress through the oil. Now, if this shim was thicker, or if you had more of these on top of each other, that would make it harder for the oil to bend this shim stack out of the way. That would, in essence, stiffen the compression side, or it would slow down the rebound side as we s make these shims or replace them with thicker shims. Now, typically, thickness of shim is uh, an even number, 8 thousandths, 10, 12, 15, and there's some 20s, depend, especially in kings, but now in foxes as well. And these thicknesses are quite a big difference when it comes to how these are bent and moved out of the way. These are really high grade, like uh, spring steel. Same, it, it's not the same, but it's like a coil spring or like a leaf spring that's designed to bend its whole life and not break, and that's why this uh, valving is very expensive. Expensive as far as uh, per shim. So this one right here is probably two bucks. Uh, that's probably a buck seventy-five. That's probably a dollar twenty-five. You can see a full shim stack on the table for a smaller diameter shock. So it's real, real easy when you've got a six to ten 
the six to 10 shims on a piston to have 20, $25 worth of shim stacks on just one side of the piston per shock. So as much as 40 or $50 per shock in valving. And when we're changing that, we're changing all of it. So that's very, very easy to throw $200 in valving at one. <coughs> Behind you, Chase, take a look at some of the valving that we've got on the shelf. Real quick here, Justin. <coughs> um, Tommy Wilson, 760, asked rule of thumb, how often should you revalve your shocks? Um, well, revalving is going to be done in one of two reasons. One, you want to manage what it's doing for you. So you would change the valving if you, if you want it to be stiffer. Or you could change the valving if you want it to land a little bit better from a rebound standpoint. So that would be any time you want to modify how the car works, you would revalve it. Um, but if you're looking at revalving it to try and get rid of the shims that might be old and worn out and kind of do it on a preventative basis, then we kind of use that rule of thumb, uh, same as we had yesterday with coil springs in the race car, 3,000, 4,000 race miles or about eight or 10,000 play miles. <clears throat> so typically when we see shocks that have that kind of mileage on them, we're taking all the valve shims out of it and replacing them with new ones. Now, shims on the shelf. These are just some of our shim bins. Um, you're looking at thousands and thousands of shims per bin. Um, just this wall of shims is about a half a million dollars in shims. And this is what it takes to change and modify the internals of a shock individually for every customer that we have. You have to have this much um, inventory so that you can change one customer to the next to get what they're looking for in their driving style and what they've given us um, and told us what they want the car to do. Um, you can't do, one thing a lot of people, what we get a lot is that we've got a cookie cutter um, valve stack that is not true. Um, what we do is test our own stuff. We come up with a baseline, we modify it for weight and accessories, driving style. We've got 17 to 20 different shim stacks that we would run according to how much someone uh, weighs, drives, uh, and where they are. And then on top of that, we'll modify it even more so for that particular customer's needs. So uh, no such thing as cookie cutter. All we have is a baseline that we'll then modify from. So Justin, going with that one, I got a uh, Benson B350 asking, what's the big difference between dune and desert setups? So the difference between dunes and desert, the desert does not have giant G outs at the bottom of a 10 story dune that you're gonna run through at 60 miles an hour and bottom the car out. That massive G out at the base of a hill is probably the most stress and, and uh, to a shock system that you could throw at it. In the desert, you're never gonna find that. So desert tends to be a little bit more plush setup. Dunes only tends to be a little bit more firm because you have to control that bottom out resistance in the big G outs and the big bowls. So to a simple, simple answer, uh, dunes are stiffer. Uh, desert is a little bit softer. You can, with a lot of the shocks today, with the range of adjustment they have in the compression adjuster, you can do both, as long as we know that in advance and set the system up for it. <clears throat> a little off topic here, but we got the green <coughs> store asking, when will the steering system for the Polaris Turbo S be available? So as of right now, if you want to book an appointment and drop your car off, we'll put a Turbo S system uh, rack in your car. But until we have the instructions published, we're not going to sell the racks for someone to put in their own car and maybe another state. So I would say uh, two weeks, we'll have the video done so you could buy it online. If not, set an appointment, we can do it right away in the shop. <clears throat> so back to valving and pistons. Now, if you guys have an idea of how valve shims work when sitting on a piston as a piston is moving through that shaft and through oil, then let's go a step further. The next thing is to try and ramp up the amount of compression that the shock gives you for the last little bit in a bump stage or a giant dune G out or hit or bottom out or jump landing. Okay, shock companies do this in a couple of different ways. One of the reasons why Walker, Fox, Bilstein and everybody uses a different style is because they're trying not to infringe on each other's patents. So for instance, <coughs> Fox uses an internal bypass or a secondary piston in an RC2. This is a Fox internal. Fox shaft, Fox piston, valving, secondary piston. The way this works is as this is traveling through an internal tube, 
this secondary piston will come in contact with a secondary cup. As it comes in, it gets really stiff because this cup is also valved on top. You can change the valving for this, which is your bump stage. So by just adding a second piston, which is also a tight fit, you go from compression adjustment from your valving to compression adjustment on the secondary piston, which slows this down tremendously, allowing it to be plush in the middle and <clears throat> stiff at the end. That's a Fox thing. Well, to get around that, here's a walker. So this is a walker off of an XP1000 front shock. There's no valving on this, but if there was, you'd see shims covering up these ports. As this system travels through a shock tube, when it gets to the end, it goes into a needle compression zone. And this needle goes into the shaft, blocking off fluid that normally flows through the shaft. As this blocks off that fluid, it becomes stiff. So for a walker, a needle system is its bump stage. For a Fox, the secondary piston cup design can be its bump stage. There's other ways of doing this too, and we'll talk about these bypass tubes right now. So with Fox, Fox also has an internal bypass shock. Now, the way that works is you've got a piston and a shaft traveling through this bypass tube. There's also another tube on the outside of this one, which is the main body tube you see from the outside of the shock, fluid between these two. As that piston travels through this bypass tube, it hits side stacks, or what we call a side stack. And the way that is, this is valving that's on the side of the shock. So, as that piston comes through, it's forcing fluid through the sides and basically folds that shim stack out of the way, allowing oil to bypass the piston, hence the name bypass shock. There's multiple ports on these. Boom, as you go up the shock, one, two, three, four. This is a factory X3 uh, bypass tube. You can also see that these ports are different diameters. Well, more fluid flow equals plusher ride, but too much fluid flow would allow the piston to blow right past these and you could bottom the car out real easy. So this is actually facing this direction when it's in the car. Bottom of the shock, piston comes up. It passes this first big one boom, now you're into three ports, so it's flowing less oil. It starts to slow down, gets to past the second one, you're only into two ports, slowing a lot down. Once it passes this last port, it's only on the valve stack of the piston, and it's extremely uh, resistant in what we would consider the bump stage of a bypass shock. So I know that's a lot, and you guys probably have questions about how all that works, so shoot if you have them. Yeah, um, KMR <coughs> Fab had a good question about that. What upgrade has the gold shocks gone through since you first unveiled in 2017? Um, so when we say a uh, gold edition, basically that just means that we've been inside the shock. We've done all of our modifications to it. Um, now, if, he, if you can maybe narrow it down per car, I could give you a little bit more detail. But in general, um, we never stop tuning and upgrading all of our tunes. So um, certain cars might have less work on the inside. Certain cars would have more work. For instance, a, a Walker Evans doesn't have a bypass tube, so we can only modify about 10 things inside the shock. On a Fox bypass, we can modify about 15 things inside the shock because we've got bypass and port locations and bypass tubes we can make. Um, the, the, uh, he said it is his X3. His X3. Yep. So uh, since the unveiling of an X3, I would say that we've gone through 11 or 12 modifications uh, from our original tune. Mitch, you'd actually be a really good person to ask that. Would you say about that many or more? Yeah, maybe even a little bit more, honestly. I mean, we're always playing with that car significantly just because of the improvements that are had throughout the bypass tube itself, the piston valving kind of as Justin was explaining as well. Um, very cool shock and there's a bunch of different ways to kind of play with it. So we're, we're always upgrading and improving our stuff on specifically that car for, for the most part. Right, so um, if you go with uh, say 12 upgrades that we've probably handed someone or when someone brought their car in for an update, we would have gone through about 12 versions of that. But for all of those versions, there's probably been three or four that we've done on our own to narrow down to one more upgrade. Um, so a lot, to answer your question, uh, a lot of changes have happened, especially if you've got an older X3, then it might be something where you want to bring it in, let us do the rebuilds and update it.
So I got a uh, made for passions here. So will you guys adjust shocks to a new suspension setup that I would put on my Can-Am from a going to six from 64 inch wide to 72 inches wide? Um, so if your question is, would we change what we normally do um, from one direction to the other? Yes. If your question is, um, you know, wh are we going to make any changes at all, depending on whether you've got different widths? The answer is yes, there too. So. Um, we would have a different internal valving and bypass port. Uh, well, if it's a 64 car, then it's probably not a bypass shock that came on it. If it was a 72 or maybe you bought bypasses and put it on it. So there's completely different shock internals that we would modify on either model. But you know, the short version is, yeah, the car's getting wider and so we're going to change spring rates. We're also going to change valve package. Um, and if it's a bypass car, we're going to change bypass tube. All right, so next, let's just go back to what's on the bench. So now that we have, we have valving, how that works on a piston, we have the ramping up of bump stage into a cup, into a needle, or through a bypass port system. The next thing that we can talk about is an adjuster. So this is simply the compression adjuster that you see on most boxes. On this one, it's a three-click position adjuster, compression, high speed only. On this one, it's a DSC, which is going to be a dual compression adjuster. And this is high speed on the outside, low speed on the inside. What's high and low speed? High and low speed are shaft speeds. That does not mean how fast you're driving the car. Shaft speed is going to be shafts moving slow, shaft moving fast, big hit. That's basically the difference. So. When you're talking high and low, the low speed adjuster is going to be chop, chatter, and body movements in the car. The high speed adjuster is going to be the biggest hits, whoops that are two feet tall or bigger, jump landings, G outs, wash cross, cross grain stuff where it hits it really hard, that's going to be the high speed. These adjusters, which this one is taken apart and spread out on the bench, here's a complete one, basically are restricting the oil flow that transfers from the top of the shock into the reservoir. So this is controlling basically shaft displacement as a shaft comes into the shock. It's controlling that oil. It has nothing to do with the oil that's going through the piston on the shock. Strictly shaft displacement. Um, if you take one of these apart, you'll see that it's got basically a preloaded spring that allows you to hold adjustments and it has valving too. These are all valve shims and a piston that's inside of this adjuster. So you've got valving on one side and compression valving on the other. Multiple uh, ways to change this. There are multiple part numbers of adjusters for shocks. From Fox, you get four to five different adjusters in their uh, catalog. We don't bother with buying the different adjusters. We basically valve our own. So we make it what we want it to be. And that valving is going to be specific to the customer terrain and how they drive. Yeah. So I got a Brunson 13, or 1396, excuse me. Do you have setting suggestion, setting suggestions to start with a 2017 X3 with your spring kit? Um, as far as a compression and rebound adjustment is concerned, I'm assuming you have an RS, so you have both adjusters on there. If that's the case, then if you have our spring kit and you have stock valving, then I would say to run both compression adjustments all the way loose, which would be counterclockwise. There are four full turns of adjustment. Um, on the rebound side, I'd like to see the front at four clicks clockwise from zero. So our zero is all the way loose. So run the adjuster all the way loose. On the rebound, you've got clicks. Six per turn. So on the rebound, put four in the front, um, put six in the rear, run all compression all the way soft. And the way I want you to adjust that is to drive the car. And if you can bottom the car out easily, then start putting high speed into it. And that would be quarter of a turn to half a turn at a time of high speed until it stops bottoming out. The low speed adjuster, this guy right here, you're going to turn that in until the car's boatiness <coughs> goes away and becomes settled and kind of stops. Once it's stopped, you know you've gone too far on the high, uh, low speed adjuster when you've turned it further and you start to feel all the chop and go right back where you used to be and that's how you sneak up on that. Reason I'm telling you to go soft 
is because the valving in that with our spring kit, factory valving is on the stiff side. If we have done the inside of that shock already, I would probably be telling you to run two and two, two turns and two turns, which is right in the middle for compression. And I'd have a little bit different setting for rebound too. I got a great question here, Justin. I think we get asked this a lot as well from uh, S Buyers 04. Can the QS3 valve be swapped to DSC valve without any other changes? Um, yes, it can, as long as the shock is two and a half inches in diameter and bigger. Also, if the shocks are 2018 and newer, is that, eight, is that right? 18 or 17, 17 Mitch? 17. 17 and newer. So Fox standardized all of those uh, measurements from late 17 on and for two and a half inch diameter and larger. So the answer is yes, if you have something in that range. So uh, Expedition underscore lab has a uh, X3 Max XRS running 35 inch Tenzer DSs. Can you turn, can you tune with a tire that size as well? Also, can you couple your RIS in conjunction with the Fox IQS? Absolutely on all of those. So 35 inch tire, um, the difference is the unsprung weight. So it tends to hit something small and flop around a lot. So you're gonna run a lot more of the low speed adjustment into the system to try and keep the tire from flopping and settle it. Um, rebound wise, there's a little bit of rebounds that we wouldn't wanna play with with a big tire like that. We wanna slow it down a little bit so as it droops out, that extra weight isn't coming out too fast. Um, but it's all done in the adjuster. You can easily control it. From the standpoint of <clears throat> our internals and an IQS, yes, so IQS, is right over here, and that is the electronic adjustment system from Fox. Um, we are the sole distributor and installer of this kit, and it was developed in conjunction with Fox and us. The way this system works is it converts everything you have via a new ECU system, wire loom, and also adjusters to electronic adjustability. So that manual system that I've been showing you with adjusters is now converted to an electronic system. You can run IQS with any internals and any spring kit. It's not going to care. You're still gonna have the adjustability from the inside of the car on the fly. But it will always work better if the inside of the shock modifications and spring kit work better. Now you're adjusting a better functioning system as opposed to adjusting a stock one. So hopefully that answers your question on IQS and internals. Another quick question about um, <coughs> adjusting uh, cars, I guess. Bad habit off-roading, best setting for Turbo S velocity. How do I adjust the rebound properly? Velocity, does that have a rebound adjuster? Nope. <laughs> so you do not have a rebound adjuster on that car, man. I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to play with it. Um, there's only a couple things you can do without a rebound adjuster. Um, none of which I would recommend because it's like uh, being stuck in Mexico and have to do something. Sometimes we could run the nitrogen pressure a little bit lower, like um, 120 PSI instead of 200, that'll slow the rebound down. You can raise the crossover, that'll help because you won't get into a heavy rate as early and it would not extend as quick, which slows the rebound down. Um, you could also lower the ride height, which will stop lower some of the spring rates, which will slow the rebound down. These are all band-aids to get home. There's nothing that you can do with the adjustment because you don't have one. One of the reasons why we prefer some of the shocks like um, the Foxes with adjusters all over the place, including a rebound adjuster. Cool. We've got a couple <coughs> of questions about the IQS here from mm -hmm. uh, Scouts P and Hogue 250R. Do you run IQS on the race car? If not, why? And does the IQS work on a 2016 turbo with Fox shocks? So uh, we do run the IQS on our race car. As a matter of fact, it was in our race car for the Mint 400, which we podiumed, and then um, the next day they gave us fourth. I can tell you in that race, it was amazing because we would go through from dry lake bed, <coughs> dry lake bed, um, small whoops, to immediately car size whoops, where we really needed to either slow down for the big stuff or we could turn the system all the way stiff and blast through it. So during the race, we were constantly putting it in soft for some of the chopped out rocky washes and running it in the middle, uh, medium setting for the majority of the race and then going full stiff for some of the big stuff so we could go through there at 60 or 70 miles an hour where normally we would only be able to do 40. So yes, we run this on the race car, run it on our pre-runner, we run it on every car we have. Um, to answer the other question, 
That was a turbo, 16 turbo? Yeah, 2016 turbo with Fox shocks. Yes, you can absolutely put IQS on that car because it has Foxes on it, which the adjuster is compatible. Um, even though that's prior to 17, that one is actually correct um, from that adjuster diameter standpoint, and we can install that kit. You would love it. Um, everybody that runs it loves it, and I don't think people understand how cool it is because it's not like you just set it one setting and run the day. Um, we find that we set it, uh, change it, you know, three times a minute. It will come into a hard corner and stiffen it up so there's less body roll, go back to soft and have that plush ride. Um, in the dunes, we'll run it around all the way plush, but when you come into a nasty G out, we'll just click it all the way soft, hit the all the way stiff, hit that G out, don't bottom the car out, and go all the way soft back again. Throw guys in the car, stiffen it up, loosen it up. We just find that once you get used to it, you use it as a driving tool more than a tuning tool. Um, so back to shocks. We went over that, cups, bypasses. Um, let's do. How about um, nitrogen and uh, fade? So <clears throat> all shocks are charged with nitrogen, just like these bottles right here. Um, nitrogen does two things. One, um, it keeps, well, well, really mainly it, it, it does one thing. Um, it stops cavitation in the oil when the piston runs through it. So for instance, if this piston is surrounded in oil, through a tube and you're just cruising along, all of a sudden you hit something big, boom. It moves so fast through the oil that it can actually separate the oil molecules and cavitate the oil. It's not unlike um, a propeller on a boat, prop on a boat, when you're going from um, idle and you throw way too much throttle at it and it cavitates the blade and revs the motor until that water comes back around the blade and the speed of the blade and the water coincide and it starts to get basically traction on the water and it takes off. Okay, what's happening is that blade is spinning so fast that it separates the water molecules, spins in a vacuum and revs the motor. Same thing happens here. So this can separate that oil from itself if it comes through too fast. Nitrogen supplies pressure on the oil that's in the system so this piston cannot separate that oil molecule and cavitate it. So it makes it to where what this valving has in it always functions the way it's supposed to instead of having dead spots or loose spots or maybe the harder you hit something, the easier it is to bottom out because it cavitated the oil. Now think about the lake. If we could put 200 PSI on the surface of the lake, you would never cavitate a prop, no matter how much horsepower you had. You couldn't do it. That's what's happening here. So stopping oil cavitation, one thing. Two, um, it can be a tuning tool, but we try not to use that. Um, you can run as low as 130 PSI and not have much cavitation unless the shock is larger diameter and the car is heavier and you're racing. Then 150 would be your minimum. We run 200 PSI because a lot of these shocks uh, can leak. A lot of people charge their shocks on their own. They don't have good gauges. We wanna make sure they're charging it at 200 and maybe their gauge is off and, and they might only get 150 in it, they're still good. So we go with that little extra just like the factory does. Um, if you charge the shock with too much nitrogen, you'll get the really choppy ride, like 250 pounds, 300 pounds, it'll start to be a little stiff in the chop, but it doesn't affect really any of the way the other uh, the shock functions in bigger stuff. Um, nitrogen is used because it doesn't expand as much as um, other chemicals do. It's not as susceptible to temperature so that the pressure in the shock is maintained uh, at a more consistent number than spiking. Shock fade. We hear this all the time, how, you know, my shocks fade easy. There's two things that control that. Let's just assume that you're driving the car incredibly hard through big whoops. How you fade a shock is by stroking that shaft fully and extending it over and over and over again. You're cycling all the oil through the valving. There's friction there oil through the adjuster, head of the shock and reservoir, there's friction there, and then the overall friction on seals and shafts add to that. Um, operating temperature of a shock is 180 to, two, to 280 degrees. So remember, if you can touch it and it's warm, no biggie, you touch it and it's hot, still no biggie, you touch it and your skin comes off, that's about the right temperature for this shock to work. So 
keep that in mind when you're playing with them. Yes, the fronts will probably be cooler than the rears because there's more airflow over the fronts. Um, unless it's a small diameter front like a Walker 2 inch, smaller diameter shocks work harder, they will run hotter. Larger diameter shocks work less, they'll run colder. Um, the, you guys have something? I got a couple questions actually about the IQS system again. Okay. Um, KMR Fab has asked, is there enough wire to place the button on the steering wheel for one-handed drivers? Um, there is not at this moment, but we are working on an extension uh, for that loom so that you can run it on the steering wheel. The only reason that we don't have that yet is that the button is actually a miniature computer and there's about uh, 11 wires that go into the button and it's hard to turn that into a bungee for a steering wheel. So we've been working on a system that's a little bit nicer. Uh, it'll be out very, very soon, so you can put it on the steering wheel. Um, we've done that on our own stuff, but just like custom wiring. So uh, it's coming very soon. <clears throat> we got another really good one here that I think we get asked a lot as well is uh, from Eric SWP. The difference between Dynamics and IQS. So um, there is a, there's a big difference between the two. Um, Dynamics has a computer and it has multiple sensors on the car. Steering, throttle, brake, accelerometer, um, other things as well. Those sensors, if you floor it, the computer knows that you're accelerating and it will stiffen the back shocks to stop rear squat. If you hit the brakes, it will stiffen the fronts to stop nosedive. Uh, you turn left, it'll stiffen the right hand shock. So it's an active system that is modifying compression adjustments on the fly according to sensor input. Okay, our IQS is manual input. It does not use sensors to adjust for you as you're driving the car. It only adjusts what you tell it on the dash. I want it soft, medium, or hard. It will do that instantly, or at least in less than a second. And so you can tell it what you want to do at any moment in time, as opposed to just driving the car and letting it do what it wants to do. So dynamics, sensor input, doing it on its own. IQS is driver input, doing it what you want, doing what you want. Got a great one here from Swedge double zero. Should I upgrade my A arms and radius, radius arms prior to bringing my car in for the appointment? Um, we would prefer that you have all the accessories on your car the way you're going to drive it whenever we do the work so that we're tuning the exact weight and the exact geometry that's on the car. So if you're going to change it to long travel, yeah, we're going to want to have that before we do anything because we're going to change the springs later if you don't. So we would prefer you have everything on there. If you do not, then we've tested all this stuff and we know what it takes. So you have to tell us what you're up to so we can tune for that. Chase, you mess up the camera? Uh, you know, I gave <coughs> a little money shot on my face there. A, a total accident. Sorry. Hey, you guys have to understand, he's a professional. He still messes up all the time. <laughs> and I just wanted to give a big shout out to uh, Track Cinch Suspension and Glamis Hub and KMR Fab and Tommy Wilson 760. They give us some sweet emojis there. I just wanted to give them some shout outs. And great questions, so thank you guys. We got another one from Eric's WP. I just bought a 2020 X3, has 3.0 with, with external bypasses. Should I consider revalving and why? Um, what car was that again? Hey, Chase, show the valving and stuff since you don't have to show my face. I'm ugly for that. A, what was uh, the question? 2020 X3. 2020 X3 with should, bypasses. Should I consider revalving and why? Um, well, my answer is always going to be yes because there's so much potential when you get inside the shock to make it better. Um, the 2020s ride better than the 18s and 19s. Um, I would say that the 2020 rides about 20 or 30 percent better than an 18 or a 19. But when we do the mods on the inside of that shock, we make it ride another 50 to 60% better than it does factory on a 2020. So the benefits are there, it's worth the money. Um, all the people that we've done 2020s for absolutely say it's worth the money. Yeah, two people here, Dirty Customs. Great work as always, Justin, Frank at Dirty Customs. Thanks, the Frank. Max rides amazing, thanks to you guys. And JS. Cyphers, <clears throat> love my setup from Shock Therapy on my Polaris General. Awesome. Thank you guys for responding. That's pretty badass. I'm glad that you like your stuff. That's what we want to hear every time. We try our best. <clears throat> Most of the time we nail it. Sometimes we don't. 
Yes. But even if we don't, we always revisit it and make it exactly what somebody wants. Thanks for the input. Appreciate that. Mitch, on shock stuff, do you think there's other stuff that I should cover? I know this is generic and we can really get detailed if we want to, but you know, I don't want to lose everybody um, with the boring stuff. Well, you know what we didn't talk about is what we do. All right. So, let me start by telling you, we're never going to tell you what we do on the inside of the shock specifically. I'm not going to give you hole diameters. I'm not going to give you positions of bypass ports. But I'll tell you some of the things that we address and some of the things that we change. So let's just go into, say, a bypass shock on an X3. So we've got bypass tubes here. <clears throat> we are going to change all the valving in that system. All of the valve shims are going to change on both sides, uh, compression and rebound. Um, depending on the application, we might change the piston itself, which changes overall flow. That's not on everything. That's uh, specific to what the car is going to be used for. We are definitely going to be changing the adjuster. Um, that is also specific, and we change this differently according to what somebody is doing with it. Um, I don't have a shaft here, uh, which has got rebound stuff in it, but we do modify rebound flows. We change viscosity of the oil. That's another thing that can affect fade. As temperatures go up and you beat on the car and the thing fades, um, oil is really the major controlling factor there if you're assuming that the shock is right. If the shock is tuned wrong, you can get a lot of temperature. If the shock's tuned right, you won't. Only temperature you're gonna get is from use and friction. And the only way it fades is due to low quality oil. So the oil that we use, well, let's compare this. Fox oil <coughs> is about $30 a gallon. King oil is about $60 a gallon. Our oil, our cost is $106 per gallon. It is very, very high grade. It has a really high um, temperature rating. Uh, basically, it's not going to have any kind of breakdown until way past a shock's potential. Um, when does a shock actually come apart or fail? It's about 300 degrees. The reason is the shock actually won't have any issues. <clears throat> the issue is that at 300 degrees, Loctite melts. So all of the head caps and other components that are Loctited in place, Loctite goes away. When the Loctite goes away, you spin the head of the shock off and you start blowing parts up. Um, we've done it in San Felipe, um, both racing and pre-running, just to see what'll happen. We've gotten the shocks hot enough to take the plastic spring divider and melt the divider onto the shock and fill every thread on the shock body. So I got a little bit sideways on that. Bypass ports, other things that we modify. <clears throat> we actually make our own bypass tubes. These are bone stock, but the bypass tubes that we make have twice as many ports on them. We also change the locations of the ports. We also change the diameter of the hole, and we change the side stack valving that are on these. All of those things control how plush the car feels and how much you can ramp up that bump stage at the last little bit so it doesn't bottom out. Um, we also change extension springs. What these guys are here, there's multiple springs you see. These are the spring on the bottom of the shock shaft. When the shock extends, this spring compresses and tries to stop the shock from extending on itself. That is the clunk that you hear on full extension on most shocks. On a walker, it is a hydraulic system. <clears throat> As this, imagine this is extending right here. There is a cup on the inside that this fits into and that squirts oil out at the last second. So that's a hydraulic stop. These, this is the extension noise that you hear in a walker. All right, never mind. Parts went flying. Sounds like this. That's what you're hearing and where it comes from. On a Fox, this spring is fully compressed and then you hear the aluminum on aluminum or you hear the, the seal cap against the base of the piston. That's where the noise comes from. Now we change these. There's different rates for these and we have had them made by Fox for us. We've got hardened spacers, other items that we change. Uh, I might have touched on, what, eight things. Uh, we do about 14 things about inside the shock. Mm -hmm. 